So Terry, should I begin the program? Are we still a minute or two out? I say it's one o'clock. Let's do it. Well, hello everyone. Very glad to have you here, whether you're on Zoom, on Facebook, joining us for this event, The Art of Collaboration and Response with Glassworks. I'm Mona Sigatola Slami, the afternoon and evening announcer on WXXI, Classical 91.5 in Rochester. Glad to be here with these amazing guests that we have, Jessica Martin, the curator of the exhibition, The Path to Paradise, Judith Schechter's Stained Glass Art, at the Memorial Art Gallery, composers Jonathan Russell, Edie Hill, Jung Sung Kang, and Andrea Mazzariello from around the country have all written music in response to the Battle of Carnival in Lent by Judith Schechter, and she has now responded to each of their compositions with references to her other works and general ideas from art and music and history in a series of videos. And we have here artist Judith Schechter also joining us for this discussion and the musicians of 5x5 Five Five who have played and commissioned these compositions are also here to be part of discussing the work. And we're going to hear samples of each of the pieces to situate us in these musical worlds throughout the event, though you can also hear the full pieces in concert recordings on 5 by 5s website. And you can find a link to all of Judith's response videos with the music there as well at 5 by 5 musiccom But first, let's get into the visual world of Judith's artwork. And I had initially been planning on introducing during the work, but I actually just got cut up in looking at it, as perhaps all of you were also on the screen chair. So just briefly, Judith Schechter has lived and worked in Philadelphia since graduating in 1983 with a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design Glass Program. She's been exhibited around the world, recognized with major grants, including the Guggenheim Fellowship and NEA Fellowships. Her work is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Hermitage in Russia, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Renwick Gallery, the Smithsonian Institution, and numerous other public and private collections. And from her statements, though we have her here to talk to us, I was really drawn to two statements. Um, that in working with glass, possibilities lie in mating difficult emotional ideas with sensuous but cruel materials. And also that the figures in her work seem to be caught in transitional moment when despair becomes hope or darkness becomes inspiration. They seem poised between the threshold of everyday reality and epiphany caught between tragedy and comedy, which seems to have perhaps some relation for our discussion, discussion today and also for the worlds we're facing today. So please join me in welcoming Judith Schechter. So glad to have you here. Well, thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks for showing the pieces. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm thrilled. I was really and thrilled to have music composed about anything I ever did. <laughs> so I was wondering if you would um, start with talking a little bit about the experience of this project, of hearing the music that was created for you first in the moment, and then now that you've had an opportunity to listen again, sort of this thing that recordings give us a chance to consider it not just in our memory. Well, I first heard the pieces live um, the day after the exhibition opened. I think that was February 16th or something in Rochester at the museum. I hadn't heard anything at all previously. And um, I will say that's probably not the most optimal situation for anyone to give something an objective listen, but it was a remarkable experience, really um, gratifying. I liked the pieces. I, um, I could see connections between them and my work, and it was thrilling. Um, now, then, uh, recently, when I was asked to respond to them, I, that was, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful thing to be asked. Um, it, gave, it felt like uh, the uh, feedback loop was completed. Um, <clears throat> so I listened to the pieces very carefully, many, many, many times in a row and uh, took notes. This is not how I ordinarily listen to music. I never take notes. I'm usually on a elliptical trainer. Um, <clears throat> but I listened very carefully and I thought about the pieces. Um, I dreamt about Jung Sung Kang's piece. Uh, <laughs> I, it, I literally was playing in my head as I dreamt. And uh, I really thought deeply about some of the uh, the ways inspiration works, because it's my understanding of inspiration is no one asked the composers to illustrate one of my works. They asked them to be inspired by it. And that's a, a, a fantastic request in that it gives the artists freedom to, to go to their own place with it. And I, it was really interesting to me where they went and how they responded to the piece. And before I bring in the composers, I think perhaps at this time I want to bring in Jessica Martin, a curator from the Memorial Art Gallery, who's the one who curated your exhibit, Judith, to talk about what it was like bringing together this art and then realize that there would be other things besides the artwork on the wall as part of the experience for people who are interacting with this exhibit. Yeah, um, I absolutely uh, imagine that for many curators, the goal is to support an artist and their creation of art, but also to help audiences experience the work and understand it in sort of a variety of ways and on many levels. Um, so that's, that's our main job right inside of the space of the gallery. But then there are all of these other opportunities that museums can create to um, engage with an audience and to find ways for audiences to connect with the work. And this was a particularly dynamic, I think, um, opportunity, not only to um, connect with audiences, but to actually support artists making art and artists making art that's inspired by the work of other artists. And so that idea, like you were saying, Judith, of the feedback loop um, is so powerful and, and relevant and exciting um, with this project. And I see that someone asked if we were going to be hearing the music. We will be hearing samples throughout, sort of just 30 seconds or so to situate us in the musical worlds, but then definitely want to invite everyone to listen to the pieces. And if you haven't had a chance beforehand, it's fine. But afterwards, watch these videos where you hear the music and experience this sort of artistic response as Judith talks about each of the pieces and brings in her other work. So I think we are going to um, start with Jonathan Russell and hear some of his music written in response to the Battle of Carnival and Lent we'll be hearing. And so Terry will start the music and we'll hear a little bit. Thank you. 
So by way of description, John, or introduction, Jonathan Russell is a clarinetist and bass clarinetist, conductor and teacher, as well as composer based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He approaches both composing and performing with curiosity and omnivorous appetite. In addition to classical music, he also plays klezmer and Balkan music and freely improvised and known for his unique and innovative approach to bass clarinet. And he's written that his compositions are unified by directness of expression, emotional power, and visceral musicality. So I want to welcome Jonathan Russell and talk a little bit about your work, but also about what it's like now hearing the response since we have this experience. Sure. Um, thank you. It's, it's, I'm really glad to be here. Um, well, I was I was really taken with Judith's work um, as soon as I as I saw it. So. Um, it sort of, there, there wasn't, it didn't take very much effort on my part to be inspired by her work. Um, I think the approach I took in, in a way is kind of a, a fairly traditional approach. It's, it's similar to, you know, probably the most famous piece of music inspired by art is Mussorgsky's Pictures and Exhibition. And basically what he does is he creates a narrative that goes with the picture. And that's more or less what I did um, with the Battle of Carnival in Lent as well. I kind of imagined what led up to it, to that scene that we see and then the aftermath of that. And then um, in, in terms of Judith's um, response, it was interesting to, for me to see some other works of hers that she, she felt fit into some of the ideas of the procession and the kind of grotesque, burlesque, tragic comedy kind of aspects of it. So I'm, I'm glad that she saw that in my music because that was meant to be there. <laughs> and that's we have in the um, comments, a wonderful um, response from Jean Peterson, who's listening, who said that, you know, she's struck by that contrast between the ethereal beginning and then the wilder part. And one thing that happens is in the artwork, this is seen sort of all at once, or we see it in our own time, but in music, it happens over time. So that's something that really came out in the video response, I think, that sense of temporality. I wonder if Judith and Jonathan have a response, but this might be a nice time to bring in some of the musicians to talk about their experience with working through these contrasts in that, in that piece. And perhaps I can call on uh, Marcy, especially perhaps as a clarinetist who's in a clarinet world for your experience of the dualities of this piece and even you have a duality of instruments in it. Oh, I was pushing the space bar. There we go, you're on. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, hang on, what, technical difficulties, unmute. No. I had a, a box that I had to get rid of. Okay, we're okay. technical difficulties. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> oh lordy. Um, it was a challenge. Um, the I like I like playing the bass clarinet, and I'm getting better at it as we tackle more of the pieces that require it. Um, but I think I've grown a lot in those last couple of years by playing challenging music like what Jonathan wrote for me, which I just love playing, even though it's really, really difficult. It, it really explored the range, the, the lowest notes down into the alternate notes that not all bass clarinet, or I guess that one did have, but, but really the low end and then the extreme high register. Um, and I had to do both of those things in both the, the quieter, somber, serious moments, as well as the raucous, the world is on fire kind of, of passages. So it was, it was a challenge all around, but very much um, enjoyable. I just wanted to say, Marcy, you sounded spectacular on every note you played. Thanks. And I guess while we're in this mode from anyone, are there, I mean, the video discusses it in some ways, but bring up any of the specific works that came up in the response, if we want to tease any of that out a little bit more, sort of as we think about what got evoked. Because I'm also fascinated that sometimes what we mean in an artwork doesn't necessarily, I mean, that can matter, but what people perceive also just becomes part of it, whether or not that intention was known to us when something was being created. I think artists' intentions are given too much importance in this world. Uh, you know, I don't even know what my own intentions are. I have to make the piece to figure it out. So <laughs> I assume that people work through it as they experience the artwork to some extent. 
<clears throat> hey, Mona, you're muted. Ah, <laughs> so pardon that. I want to keep bringing in the musical voices and widening out the conversation. So I think we'll still be hearing more from John, but we're going to continue on with more of our musical examples going next to hear from Manhattan by Jung Sung Kang. So Jung Sung Kang is a pianist as well as a composer and a passionate educator, and she got her doctorate in Rochester at the Eastman School of Music and is based in New York City since 2013. And as an educator, she encourages her students to listen broadly and boldly to many different styles and genres, the same year as absorbing Brahms, Zanakis, or Radiohead. And I guess I can add to this as well after hearing this piece, absorbing the sounds of jazz. And her own compositions take this wide-ranging eclectic approach. So welcome, Jung Sun. Thank you for the music. And as we discuss, I want to hear first some of your thoughts on hearing the response, but also perhaps framing this part of the discussion as engaging with different pasts, referencing, borrowing, and rejecting both artistic images from the past, but then different musical languages and styles. Thank you, Mona, for that question. Uh, I used to listen to you all the time when I was at Eastman, so I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I love Judith's video. Um, like she said, it wasn't any mean, it was an attempt to describe her piece. It is, I think it is, it, it's quite impossible. But I would say Manhattan didn't exist without her piece because it really inspired me to, like, my thought process. I wanted, I, I wanted to do something with jazz. It's because it's just like her image was very striking as a street art in New York City. And then I thought about the duality because her technique is just so amazing. And then street art, maybe not so much, but it's very carefully drawn art. It has very spontaneity to it. It almost, some, sometimes it feels like improvised to me. So I kind of wanted to express those dualities. And then I had like five or six different sketches before I finally kind of went into this very limited motion, I did very like jazzy and fast, energetic. It just didn't seem like enough. But but I when when I heard Judith mention that attempting to express duality, I was like so touched because I think that's what I really wanted to express. And perhaps Judith, you can share some of your thoughts. I think this has come up in a number of discussions of your work of engaging with this past, these files that you have of ideas and how you bring them together and find your own path with all these other voices and images in your head. Well, I can talk very personally about that, but I also think that's pretty common for most creative people who make projects uh, that I feel like my head is a, a uh, crock pot and, uh, and all this stuff simmers in the crock pot and then it comes out. <laughs> and, um, I don't, I actually teach a course in the creative process at Pennsylvania Academy and the more I teach it, the, the more mysterious it becomes. I don't have any answers and neither do psychologists or art theorists or philosophers. It's just mysterious how this works. And I do, I, I think, I mean, all of us, uh, just looking at the Zoom screen here, I think we are all sort of born in the postmodern era. 
And one of the hallmarks of postmodernism was eclectic influence. We had a broad education, hopefully, and we learned a lot of stuff and it was all kind of inspiring and it all went into the crock pot. So I, I think that was, and it was definitely part of Jun Sun Kang's piece that you could hear the, the strains of, of things. So it's eclectic, but it's not chaotic necessarily. Sense and meaning definitely emerges. And I just love, there was a description from Jean again in the chat saying that this music makes her think of the twinkling lights along the Hudson River as the night starts to fall. So wanted to share that sort of beautiful observation and maybe open it up to the musicians and actually to anyone really at this point, but especially musicians as we're, you were realizing something, you're classical performers primarily, even though we're in this, have all these different experiences, but there are elements of jazz in this piece. How did this affect what you were playing or how you expressed it? Did you think about, I guess, knowledge of jazz or, or others with this piece? Uh, when we were rehearsing it, um, we definitely wanted to give it this sense of walking. Um, and, and you could feel it if you even just played the notes, no musicality at all. It still had that sense of uh, pace, like you're wandering through a place looking at different things and items would come at you, you'd notice them. And so that was what we really tried to convey, uh, keep a forward motion going as well as being able to pass off these little bits of phrasing to each other um, without halting, without waiting. Uh, it kind of reminded me of we had to become a relay team where you're passing the baton to the next player without, without slowing down, without having gaps in the music. And um, it really, this piece really gave us a chance to come together very intimately. Um, as a string player, I'm used to breathing, being able to breathe any time that I want to, but I noticed to, for me to really come in well after a wind player, I really got to know what Marcy and Laura, how they would play the note just by the breath they would take before, as they're preparing for that note. And that was such a wonderful experience. I think also we talked in rehearsal about the swing feeling, the to have that underneath to propel the the phrases forward and also a lot of um, visual communication I think improved in the group from this piece from playing together and kind of really connecting um, in a way that other pieces do but I don't know I felt like that this that this piece helped our communication grow between us so that was kind of that was a wonderful result I have a question for the musicians when you were learning and practicing these pieces together, were there like different versions or is it always kind of the same? I, I did play in a band myself and I wouldn't compare it to what you guys did. So I don't know if I'm, I'm curious. I think we had different ideas that we had to talk out. Um, you know, I think, I think for sure, uh, with Manhattan, we spent a lot of time reflecting and um, experimenting. Would you guys say also? I mean, I, that that I remember that piece um, needing a little bit more uh, uh, from us as a group and also individually, kind of trying to make sense of what what would bring it alive to the best that that we could. So, um, and yeah, I know there was a lot of discussion about how to bring it alive, and we didn't always agree. I have a thing. Go ahead. It uh, to me, I felt like it it evolved. We we tried a few things, and then um, you know we kind of did the literal thing that it said on the page, and then we started to play with tempos. We started to play with um, what would you say like m what's the word momentum? Where does it have momentum, and where does it want to be in the moment? And it 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 actually evolved a lot as we rehearsed it over the time that we had it. And as a listener. I hear, I'm not sure if I've changed in how I've listened or if your interpretation changed even from the premiere at the mag to the recording that we're hearing that's from the performance in Buffalo that I hear more through line. And I don't know if that's maybe at the time of the premiere I had, who's coming up next? How do I pronounce their name? Did I lose that piece of paper? Lots of things in my mind, you know, so there's we as the listener change, but I've heard 
yeah, more of that motion that you're talking about actually was one thing that really came through for me in the piece. I think we felt that too. I think even as we were playing in Buffalo, we felt that we're making visual cues for each other. Like, I think we're getting it. I think we got it. I think it's making sense. So I'm glad that the, that that came across. And I know in the Meet the Composer events, I was at Jonathan Russell's, that's something, the way that it changed, not just your interpretation, literally he was there and you would play a passage and say, do you like A or B better? And he'd be like, what if this guitar sound, especially Sungmin has a lot of ability to change, I think, an affect of his instrument with, um, you know, the very, I mean, there were all different types of performance, but I think I heard a lot of change in Jonathan's piece with the way Sungmin approached what the guitar was doing and what language it was speaking at that moment. Can I just chime in for a second? Just that was, that was one thing that was really nice about this process from a composer's perspective that we had that Meet the Composer event. You know, for me, it was several months before the premiere and had that chance to work with performers and get the feedback. Because often as a composer, you're in this situation where you come in the day before, hear the piece for the first time, and it's, um, you can try to make some changes, but it's, 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 a little, it's a little dicey to do anything significant. So that was, one, that was another thing that I really enjoyed about this process. <clears throat> And I think we're going to hear a little bit more music now. We're going to get into the sounds of Andrea Mazzariello's music here. And um, Terry will put that up on the screen for us. <laughs> And that is Andrea Mazzariello, who's a composer, performer, writer, and teacher, is on the faculty at Carleton College in Minnesota, and his musical practices include writing songs, making electronic music, and working in notated traditions. And his work explores spoken and sung treatments of his own original texts, playing with computers and other kinds of electronics, and engaging with the physiology of performance in novel ways. So glad to have you here, Andrea. And I don't know if you'd want to just jump in with some of your thought on hearing the response to your response. Sure. Thanks, Mona. And, and thanks, everyone. This was really a pleasure to get to do. Um, I got to go to Rochester three times. It was really exciting um, seeing Judith's response and hearing her, her, her sort of like um, interpretations of an interpretation. It was just so fascinating. And it was such an honor to me that um, she would take the time to engage this music. Um, it, it, it felt so reciprocal and and just really really lovely um i loved the pairings the the ideas of like for example there's a <laughs> there's a moment where she says this is this for <laughs> i don't know how to bring up a bird vomiting in a tactful way but there is this moment in her response video where she talks about a piece of hers that this bird is like projecting all of this these beautiful shards of glass onto some unwitting human and um, the humor uh, together with there's like humor and rigor and so many kind of wonderful um, vectors of response. It was really great to get to hear that. I don't remember the question anymore. How, how am I doing? You're doing great. It's mainly, in fact, I love when Judith got to ask a question of the musicians. So perhaps I can also ask you to start thinking of what you want to ask each other and I will sort of slowly fade into the background though I will share a few comments we've had one which is that it's so cool to hear how rehearsing these different pieces makes the group's approach to communication grow in different ways so perhaps we can also cover communication in this piece and the others and also Jean writes about how mysterious the uh, oven between worlds space and time so we're back again to the temporality of music and the space in the art that still sometimes captures some sense of temporality so I'll maybe toss it to Judith and then let everyone talk for a little bit. Um, everyone's piece was, had, had something superlative about it. And I thought, I don't think I shared this in the video that I made about it, but I thought the piece was really beautiful. 
And that's something I think about as an artist, which is why the bird vomit came up, because uh, <laughs> that was a compliment. Apparently, when a bird really likes you, it tries to feed you. Yeah. And that's how they do that. Um, but that, that, that particular artwork is one where I really made it a point to be beautiful. And as anyone who is in the arts probably knows, beauty is something that people like to fight about because it can be seen as frivolous. And um, that to me is very sad because uh, I, I personally, I, I, it's on the wall of the museum. I, my philosophy. Uh, I think beauty is is important as a, a a way of making a difficult life bearable, and uh, uh, beautiful music more than beautiful artwork has saved my sorry behind on a number of occasions. So I just appreciated the the beauty of that piece, and I, I as a, a moment to meditate on the idea of, of an in between, which the commenter. Um, Jean said in the chat, which is, uh, I think, a really perceptive comment. Uh, one of the reasons I think music can be so profoundly moving, um, and that's not really a compliment. <laughs> like, uh, visual art doesn't make people cry the way music does, but I will cry at television commercials. That's what I mean. It's not, not exactly a compliment, but it is a, a faculty of music. And I think it's because it ends, and when it's over, it's like, where'd it go? I know I can play it again, but is it really ever going to come back? Part of me doesn't believe it. And so it's a, it's a profound like, moment of grief when the beautiful moment ends in, in a musical piece. Yeah, if I could just jump back on, on the idea of beauty there. I think it's something, um, something beautiful about attention. Um, the way that music can invite us into its idea of itself and ask us to pay attention and give us room to pay attention. Um, and if there was anything that I was trying to do in that piece, it was to provide a space in which attention was invited but not demanded, um, which is not the way I thought it was going at all. I mean, I, the piece that you hear is sort of like the scaffold that I was going to fill in with all this, whatever my fingers are doing, stuff, like musical stuff. I just never filled it in. I just kept the scaffold. Um, it would, so, so it's like a sort of very, un, it feels very unfinished in a way, but I also um, didn't, didn't know that I could make the same kind of claim on attention if I had neurotically filled in everything around the scaffold that I had imagined. And that feels as though we talk about, you know, many things we are, people of our time who have all this reference to history, something of our time seems very much about demanding our attention that, in fact, might seem a bit of an aside. I was just for Pentecost listening to Laurie Anderson's Language is a Virus. And in it, one of the lyrics is, everyone on the island was someone on TV saying, look at me, look at me. So this, you know, the notion of to not say look at me in a way is almost a strange idea now. And perhaps a strange idea for an artist as well, who wants perhaps, though in a complicated way, the creation to be experienced. I don't know if that's, and perhaps we can have more discussion from the musicians on this piece or from anyone and including Jessica on this sort of notion of the artwork as unfinished or as something that does or doesn't demand your attention in time or space. Um, I would be happy to talk about um, the temporal experience of uh, a visitor to a museum because that is certainly something that I'm thinking about when we're organizing the exhibition space and imagining how people might move through it. And in thinking about this um, project and our conversation today, I was thinking about how when a curator is organizing a show and developing the checklist and kind of putting together the ideas and the themes that they think um, are important, um, they are thinking about how people will move through the space of the exhibition gallery and the kind of narrative arc um, or experiential arc that you want a visitor to have. But of course, you can't control how people move through the space. So I think everybody who works in a museum always needs to understand that this is the story that you want to tell, but that's not necessarily 
the story that people will consume because they you might want them to go right but they want to go left um or one person will go left and the other person will go right and so they hear and receive that narrative arc uh in a different order and so that is certainly something that uh, is very different for the work that i do as opposed to a musician who really you know you you will experience it as as the work of art was intended to be experienced um, in chronological and you know um, that temporal fashion. So as, also as it gets into the recording, it could be on the elliptical or in the concert hall or in a quiet room with your speakers perfectly around you, or all different ways that lives music lives with us. And perhaps that's um anyone wants to chime in on either how you experience when you go look at art or some of that experience of music in time. Is it harder to play slow music or fast music? Is that a dumb question? It's just a question. <laughs> I, I found them both perplexingly difficult. <laughs> I, I don't think it's a dumb question at all. Um, I think that was, it's, it's interesting how everyone talks about how they experience the piece and I almost feel like maybe as a performer um, for us to to interpret the piece and to play the piece so that it would invite that attention um, for our listeners we it really demanded it from us as musicians we really had to give ourselves over um, one of the biggest challenges we had in performing this piece is we could actually measure the tempo we started the piece and the tempo we ended the piece. And if you don't give yourself over to the space and find that center in yourself and sort of be trusting of everyone else not to creep faster, um, you would end up faster at the end of the piece. Um, and so I really felt like, like with the Andrea's piece, you had to prepare yourself before you played that first note. You had to be calm, be at center, slow down your whole body and thinking to what the piece was going to be, and then you could successfully play it. So the hardest piece ever is John Cage's Four Minutes of Silence. <laughs> I will say, as, as a visual artist, I uh, was responding to what Andrea said about not filling in the in interstices and uh, um, I, I can't make minimal art. I, the most minimal piece I ever did is in the exhibition in Rochester and it took everything I had. It was so hard to stop myself from filling in every inch with more stuff. Really hard to do. Which piece is that, Gina? The Birth of Eve, the top part of The Birth of Eve. And every little thing is buck naked for you to see. Like, don't make any mistakes when you're doing minimalism. <laughs> and, I've, always found, I've always found deadline pressure to be helpful in terms of not filling everything in. Um, but I, I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about curation. Um, we have an actual curator here, so I hope that I'm not um, going to mess this one up. But I, I feel like so much of what it is to be a composer now because we're in a for lack of a better way to describe it kind of an anything goes moment in terms of the kind of syntax you can use the kind of traditions you can reference um you you actually are more a curator i found myself curating sound more than i thought about inventing it in this case and so i thought of the the reason the piece has the title of in between is because i was looking Judith's work up for a friend. And the first thing that came up was called the battle between Carnival and Lent. And it was a different work of art from a long time ago. And so I thought about combining of and between as this sort of weird present and past idea and also this nonsense grammar, but we can get to that another time if that seems interesting. However, the idea of going into the past and sort of curating a technique of the past, the sort of like slow moving contrapuntal world of like, you know, like Josquin with your finger on the record, so it's really slow, um, made me feel like I was curating sound more than I was sort of discovering my own language or something. And I think Terry is going to chime in with something. Um, he was on our, no, 
or perhaps not, there was just another comment from a composer, Olivia Kiefer, who Five by Five is also plays her work and she says it is harder to play slow. So that is the typical thing as a kid learning music, at least I found my teacher saying, you know, are, what fire are you on the way to? Though I find myself now tending to slow down as I play, especially as my husband is someone who tends to speed up in a piece. So then we get further apart in terms of, we both dig into our own interpretations. So I, want, I wanted to say from a wind player point of view, playing slow is much more difficult. And Andrea also challenged us to play equally soft. And flute players are not, I mean, we are fans of playing soft, but you know, <laughs> It's a, it's a little bit more challenging, you know, pitch tends to run flat. And um, so there were challenges from a technical point of view, uh, you know, playing in tune, um, keeping the line going, um, that I welcomed and appreciated because I think it challenged as a player to think play, about playing softer, blending with my, you know, with other folks in 5x5 five five in a way that, it, for me, it was a, it was a welcome challenge. I just wanted to quickly chime in. I just, there's a really cool um, uh, episode on Radiolab about Beethoven's symphonies tempos. I don't know if anyone's heard that one, but um, basically there's this whole concept about how uh, there's this kind of a certain range of tempo uh, or tempos or tempi that m most of us are really comfortable. So playing slow or playing fast is really difficult or just maintaining a, a tempo that's slow or, or fast too. Um, so just wanted to chime in on that. And I, actually, I wanted to quickly go back to what Jessica was saying about um, how, how um, visitors experience an exhibit. And I was thinking, actually, there, there actually is some sort of um, overlap, I think, when you listen to music, too, because I think if you think of um, listening to a piece of music as going through an exhibit, because the nature of our attention, we, we, we tend to sometimes drift off or focus on certain things in the music. And each time you listen, I think you can, it can be a different experience as if like you're walking through an exhibit again and you might be taking a different path, right? So um, there's definitely a, a difference, but there's also some kind of overlap, I think. We've been finding this with, we're broadcasting concerts on the radio from the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. And during that on Facebook, the musicians are hosting chats with audience members as they listen on the radio. And a number of musicians have been making interesting comments about having never heard the piece that way or not realizing where their part fit into it until they were listening in this way with people you know, outside. In some ways we think of the musicians as closest to the music, but they've got this partial view, so. I guess Eric may have had some of that experience since he plays in the orchestra. Yeah, I think for our experience of learning these pieces and performing them, because uh, we commissioned these pieces and there were no prior recordings or performances, I think we really, as we rehearsed and um, learned the music, we learned so much and we, we were always finding new things. And um, I think that's part of the experience when you, when you learn mu new music this way. And I don't know if you had something to add there, Eric, or I saw you start to move. No, one more thing, and then we will get to Edie's music, though we're having trouble keeping her on the chat. I'm hoping we'll be able to bring her in, but we'll at least hear her music and be able to discuss a little bit with that is that something Judith said about the effect music has on the emotions that the good or bad, the sense that it can hit your emotions so hard. I think it gets to some of its power is seen as very positive sometimes when it inspires to people in certain ways, but it's also that scary sublime thing that it gets beyond some of our logical sense where we get to propaganda or influence or so what is I guess some thoughts on often we talk about the power of art and power of music in this beautiful lovely inspiring way I guess any thoughts on some of art's good and scary power no one else talks I will and that is a threat um, you know, all right, you asked for it. Um, <clears throat> I think what's funny, I think, I don't, I'm not a neurologist, and I don't even play one on TV, but I am interested in how um, music and art affect us physiologically. There are a couple of people who've written about um, music versus visual art and what moves people to tears and what doesn't. And um, 
I always found it best to sort of understand that your ears are a hole right into your head and the music goes in there and it goes like down into your stomach and doesn't really spend a lot of time in the verbal sections of your brain, but the visual processing equipment goes pretty much directly into like a dictionary and an encyclopedia. And um, we do a lot of, uh, I think especially once we've been taught how to read and write, that we uh, tend to look at visual images and read them and analyze them and interpret them rather than experience them fully as an embodiment. Now, I'm going to, I, everyone who is going to be offended by this needs to turn off their live feed immediately. I think stained glass is the exception. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because something about stained glass is more like music than a reflected light situation. Because obviously, stained glass is transmitted light, and an oil painting is reflected light. Also, movies are transmitted light and TV. So there is something about light beams that remind me of music and are incredibly powerfully moving good and bad. And you know, uh, back to beauty, beauty can be used for good or evil. It just depends on who's got, the, who's got it and what they plan to do with it. And uh, let the buyer beware. Can I just add something to that? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, another important difference between visual art and music is that you kind of control how you take visual art in. Like, you can look away, you can spend 10 seconds at a painting, or you can spend, you know, an hour looking at it. You can sort of zoom in, look at different spots. Whereas with music, you can't really do that in the same way. I mean, you choose to focus on the flute or the clarinet, but it's, it's kind of there. And unless you, like, literally plug your ears, um, you can't really get away from it. And I think that may be one reason that it seems to kind of work on the emotions more directly is that you don't have as much kind of control over how you're experiencing it and you don't have that same capacity to kind of distance yourself from it if you want to. I think you think very highly of people's control over their eyeballs. I have seen people who can't control their eyeballs at all. And also if you're living with something, I have some sort of theory about like whatever an artist, visual artist grew up with on the walls, they're gonna be making something kind of like that as adult artists. So parents, don't worry too much, but be sure and buy the right posters. When I was um, attempting to advertise my senior thesis when I was 21, um, I came up with this little catchphrase where I'd, I'd put up a piece of the score and I'd say, it will literally hit you, like I scrawled it across the score. Um, and something about that has always stayed with me as a, a maybe not coercive exactly, but there, there's a way that music issues this demand, as John is saying, that is, and, and I think Judith is right, that visual art does that too in ways that we don't always um, comprehend or perceive in the same way. I do feel though, like when someone's sitting in a hall and your music starts playing, there's the sense that their time really matters, that, there, that there's this consequence to the time uh, for which they're going to be engaged in your work. Um, the good, the good part of that, I think, is that um, if the invitation is made generously, um, then people can be grateful for having spent that time with you. On the other hand, when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe like a little bit more of a um, snob or something, I would sometimes think, wow, that's, that's 10 minutes I'll never have back. I mean, I heard myself saying things like this and it's, it's embarrassing and it, it's sort of like, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me now to think that thought, but I don't think I'm the only one who um, considers music a demand on one's time in a different way than, than, looking, than looking, right? Where, whereas John's saying we can sort of like divert our attention as, as we do light. We think about that with radio a fair amount, that in some ways we're less adventurous because when you've gone to a concert hall, you've signed up to hear it. Whereas if I play something jarring on the radio, I guess I'm afraid I can lose you. It's easier to turn off a radio than to walk out of a concert hall. But on the other hand, in some ways, perhaps I should feel more emboldened because I, you have the choice. You know, I'm not fixing you there. At least I'm not someone who I think has ever walked out of a movie, but you know, certainly have turned off shows, so. I 
to see uh, a Balthus exhibition at the Metropolitan in New York, but I ended up in a history of world trade as seen through textiles exhibition, which was so awesome. And I was thinking about how the lifespan of all those people was way shorter than ours. And that they didn't seem to think it was funny to spend a good chunk of their life embroidering something. And I mean a good chunk of their life. And I think, so the reverse is true, is that how much time is invested in the creation? Can that person expect someone to look at their textile for uh, 20 years? I don't know, but uh, uh, I kind of doubt it, <laughs> unless they own it. But it's, it's, uh, it's a weird relationship to time. And uh, uh, my work is time consuming. But I, I, I know that people look at art for what, like less than three seconds? I, I actually think these thoughts, like how can I get my full three seconds? And I'm unapologetic about wanting it. <laughs> so there's that. And I guess as I realize time is running down, whether or not we can get Edie perhaps in the um, comments in the chat, it would be nice to take some time to listen to Edie Hill's music now. So that's music by composer Edie Hill, who's based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and her music's been performed around the world. She's been commissioned to compose for solo voice to choir, solo instruments to orchestra and mass band, miniature to full evening drama, and she loves the challenge of exploring all combinations, including electroacoustic and mixed media. And she describes composing as a lifelong love, and it's said that writing music isn't always an opportunity to research, learn, muse, reach down deep, and allow inspiration to come from the stuff of life. And I think the contrast in her piece, Blue Jewel, of seeing Earth from far away and then close up brings up the duality that we've referred to dualities a bit, but specifically after we've talked so much about beauty and as relative as we can say perhaps ugliness is, that there is some sense of contrast, whether it's the dissonant note, the shocking image, or so perhaps if Edie's here or otherwise in, also in her absence, we could just talk a little bit from the musicians perhaps and Judith about her piece and also then um, about some of this idea of the ugliness if it's to be expressed even though everything's maybe relative. Unfortunately Edie has been trying her best throughout this entire chat to get Zoom to cooperate and she can see us, she can hear us, but she can't communicate with us either through typing or camera or audio. So perhaps some of, um, or perhaps Judith could talk a bit about her response to this duality and then we can generally have a conversation with the musicians and other composers about some of the broader ideas. Um, when I first started the project of responding to the music, I had it in my head that I was going to um, do a sort of a raw reading, but I had already been contaminated by knowing Edie Hill had intended to to make this, um, the earth uh, sort of gradually, or, or suddenly actually, um, uh, from space. <clears throat> and I hope that, um, I didn't know Edie was from Minneapolis, so my best wishes, and I hope that you watch the SpaceX launch. Um, I thought it conveyed that incredibly well. Uh, <laughs> I, I, her, I don't, you know, when I think of ugliness, I don't think of ugliness as the opposite of beauty, but the opposite of prettiness. And I think both prettiness and ugliness are, as components of beauty. So I thought of the piece as basically um, uh, being about the incredible experience of, of close up versus far, far away. And also how it's sort of interesting how that all the things that seem like a lot of little different tiny things when you're far away from them become one thing. And, uh, you know, to me, 
the political message of uh, what the blue marble meant was really important, that the astronauts looked at Earth and went, oh my goodness, we, you know, it was a, a call to, to save the planet and ourselves. And, I, you know, I thought that came across to some extent in the piece. And we do have some comments from the audience as well. I want to bring this in just from earlier, our whole three seconds that Madeline Smith was saying, people may only look at a piece of art for a few seconds, but in a concert hall, they're captive. She's also thought about how to get viewers the full three seconds. But then Jean also wanted to know about how 5 by 5 picked these composers from so many different places and so many different styles. So perhaps the musicians can talk about then the overall sweep of, you know, which voices you brought in and what this has brought to you. Uh, I think we each contributed um, a couple of composers' names that we had in mind. I had uh, fallen in love with John Russell's music. I heard, um, I think it was a concerto for two saxophones with the Wind Ensemble at Eastman School of Music, and I wrote him soon after gawking about his music and how wonderful I thought it was. And um, Andrea Mazzarello's music uh, was familiar to me from uh, Now Ensemble and uh, Trust Fall that they had recorded, which we later uh, performed. Uh, so those were two composers I was familiar with and I, I shared those two names with everybody and um, we asked them if they were interested in, and we started collaborating together on this. There's a comment in the Q&A about um, the blue glass and blue jewel. And uh, that I, I also felt at first that maybe it would be cheating to be too influenced by the titles, because I don't know, are titles part of music to the composers? There's a question. Uh, for me, the, I used to love titling my pieces. I did it with great care and pleasure, and now I hate it. I want to call them all Opus 55 and be done with it, or even worse, untitled, which I understand is an insult to the audience. <clears throat> However, um, blue, blue glass is a, is a wild and crazy thing, and it's no coincidence, coincidence that people really love it. It, um, it halates, it vibrates, it's beautiful. <clears throat> but tell me about titling your pieces composer. Yeah, so, so I just wanted to say my piece was titled Manhattan because the first four note motif you hear over and over again, it's a direct quotation from Rogers and Hard Manhattan, although it doesn't sound like that way. The Arctic Manhattan, da -da -da -da, it does four notes. Um, and then I say like, piece like Manhattan, I knew that I was going to name it Manhattan or something like that. So either I know it at the beginning of the piece. Sometimes if I finish the piece and the ensemble wants to know the name, they're like, give me the name. And sometimes I don't know for like two months. And then like one day I was like reading a poem by Ted Hughes and it was called The Fate Playing. And I feel like it kind of fits my music well. So I ended up naming Fate Playing. But sometimes it's in incredibly hard, but sometimes I just know it by beginning. I wonder if it's same or different from other composers. Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's different. Sometimes I feel similar to Judith. I really resent having to come up with a title for a piece and just want to call it, you know, piece for piano or something. And sometimes I do have titles like that. Um, sometimes, you know, if there's, a, if there's like a very specific or clear inspiration for the piece, then it's fairly straightforward. Title, like, like Procession in Burlesque, for example, that you know, just kind of describes what it is, but it also happens to be evocative, um, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I'm torn about it because also sometimes if the, if the title is very evocative, then it sets up the listener to try and be sort of hearing that in the piece all the time, which may not be what you actually want them to be doing. Um, so I think listeners often want evocative titles. I feel like it gives them a way in, um, but I'm sort of torn about how helpful it actually is. I'd like to chime in on that. Um... Being a fan of one of John Russell's other compositions, which has the amazing title, he knows what I'm going to say, Evil Robot Spooky Space Jam for Clarinet Ensemble. And thank you again for writing that. Sure. 
Yeah, that's an example. The, the title came after the piece. I wrote the piece, and then I was like, what does this sound like? It sound, kind of sounds like some evil robots partying on a Friday night, so. I had so many titles for this piece. Um, like, uh, and some of them were like, I couldn't decide which is which, so there were all these colons, so I was trying to like sneak other titles into the title. Um, but I think what Jung Sun said is, is generally where I am with this. Sometimes it's first or last, or you know or you don't. Um, but for me, it is important. It, it sort of is like a, uh, I feel like if I can articulate a thing that I call it in my own head, then it's done. Um, then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I have a sort of like, I have a frame for this. I know, I know what it is. So of in between was like what ultimately was the, the closing of the circle. But before that, there was a title, Sfumature, which is an Italian word that Laura's partner, Pierre, taught me, um, which is about gradients of color. And then there was another title, All This Else. And then it was of in between, colon, all this else or Sfumature. And I was like, calm down, stop it, stop it. And so then you know, I rein myself in. That is, um, for musicologists, the colon, probably for a lot of writers and articles, that's an infamous thing that they tried to train me out of in school. No, you know, interesting thing, colon, the art of, I guess even this event has that, right? Where glass works, the art and response of collaboration. Well, I was gonna ask Jess, what, what is your uh, thoughts on titling? Yeah, I mean, as an art historian, titles are important. We're always looking for any clue we can get to help us understand the work and to help us unpack a work and experience it. And so um, it's, it's yes, an important I hate, thing. I hate to be the one to tell you this, but artists will mess with your head sometimes. No, I know, I know that's all true, <laughs> but, but that's also a part of the understanding as well, right? I mean, I think it's something that we can't, um, we can't rely too much on, but it certainly is an important. And we have a comment from someone watching on Facebook that says that they really believe Judith's work and 5 by 5s performance and these composers' music are really stunning. So thank you for all the incredible work. And I do want to say to anyone who, I'm glad you joined us, whether or not you had a chance to watch all these videos over the course of the week, there are a lot of demands on our attention, but they're, if you have a chance, they are all up online. So I really want to encourage you to, there's the link in the chat in both places, or you can find them on 5 by 5 social media that to take some time with this, because there are the ideas we discussed, but there's also more we didn't even get into, sort of on the playful side, the pairing of drinks and outfits and everything with um, each of the art. I don't know if we want to just, um, we are sort of coming up on two o'clock, we can go a little bit longer, but if anyone wants to throw in um, perhaps some other, oh, well, I've also been told we can keep going. So one of, I guess, general responses, but also perhaps the other thought that is the obvious question for now is so much has changed since these things were first created. What is some of how this has affected? I know some people who are creating like mad and some who can't write a note or haven't been able to for a while. So I'm curious how this has taken all of you. But also I saw that Jessica had her. Well, I was, I don't want to um, direct away from your very good questions, but one of my questions and one of the things I was so excited about with this project was having four different composers respond to the same work of art and how excited I was to see the variety in, um, in what the outcomes were. And so I wanted to ask, I know, Laura, you really were instrumental in, in organizing this project and, um, how you came to this project um, of, of deciding on one image for all of the composers to work with and what the composers felt about that as a, as a creative endeavor. Yeah, I think uh, when we first putting, started putting the, the project ideas together, when we were working with you guys, we were, um, we were kind of committed to what works were for sure that you had in in the collection and i think that um ideally i think at first we were thinking about having the composer i think the composers help me if i'm if i'm uh saying this right but i think we have this idea that the composers could pick maybe uh judith's works that were going to be in the collection and then it seemed that maybe um it would take a little bit longer to get that information and um the Battle of Carnival Lent was actually going to be already there for sure. And upon looking at it and what an amazing, uh, you know, 
how lucky we are to have that here in Rochester, we decided to focus our energy and um, and ask the composers. We we talked about it on email. You know, what does everybody think about everybody doing response pieces to this particular work? And at the end, I mean, I think and Judith's response videos speak to this is that there's these pieces are not just about that one work. They speak to you know a lot of uh, themes and 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 things that come up in her work. So the composers. I think, um, you know, t rose to the task and really uh, responded beautifully. So, um, so yeah, and I, and, and I think that um, having the responses now from Judith, it kind of confirms a little bit that there was this, you know, bigger response that took place from the, from the composers that, that was super effective. When I think about the word inspiration, um, I think about um, uh, a breath of life. And I think that uh, we, thought, we talk about inspiration in casual conversation, like it's the thing that starts the piece. But God forbid, it should be only that. It has to be the thing that is passed on from the piece and creates more inspiration um, in other people so that it's um, you know, breath of life, it's pretty life affirming. I think uh, that's something about art that is particularly helpful in troubled times like now, and that it can be paid forward in a positive way is, is an uh, amazing thing. So I am assuming that all of your music and it would be compositions or performances uh, inspires people further. So uh, it will just keep growing. One thing that, that I'd like to add um, to that, I think um, in line with, I guess, you know, with, with our, our current political climate and all, all, the, all the things that's going on and all that stuff and how there's so much divisiveness and, and I think we're all trying to find unity. I think with this specific project with the four composers, I think all of their voices really came through and that's why their pieces all sound so different, even though the source of the inspiration is the same. And I think, but at the same time, the one thing that brings it all together is um, uh, so much of the detail and, in each of the compositions. And I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying about how each time when we were learning it, we, we found so much new things to appreciate about the music. And it's just, I think it's the same thing with Judith's work. There, there's so much each time we, I think um, uh, the members of 5 by 5 whenever we went to the Meg to see the artwork with the composers, we, I think I can say for all of us, we, we all found something new each time and what we'd already experienced the artwork. And uh, I think that's one thing that really, uh, for me, brings this uh, project together. And I've been really glad to have these responses and this connection to a work that I've seen several times at the MAG over the years. And unlike perhaps with music, when I normally think I love that, I've got to go hear more things. I hadn't had the opportunity before this exhibit, which is now available online as well in a virtual format through the Memorial Art Gallery's website, to have this experience of seeing more of this, seeing more of Judith's work. So I've been really glad to have that, but also to connect to something that in a way was more familiar to me from various trips through the museum and could also say to other people, you know, that, oh, and a few people said, oh, I definitely remember that in all the things they've seen at the MAG, this work has stuck out to them in their memories, so. I wanted to ask if the book uh, that um, RIT Press published, the Jessica Martin worked on, a beautiful book, is that still, are there copies available? Um, I think, I, I know that we have some at the gallery, the museum store, which is currently, there it is, um, closed, uh, along with the museum. But I, I, it looks like we've got the link to the, um, to the website for it. So I think go through there. Um, but I did want to say, although we are still closed at MAG, unfortunately, we will be opening back up. And um, I'm very happy to say that the exhibition has been extended in Rochester into September. So um, we were very sad to have it closed in mid-March. Um, and it's been painful knowing that it's sitting there and things are beautiful and waiting to be seen. 
um, but we will have additional opportunities to see the show um, in Rochester. So please come when we open back up again. And I just wanted to step in to share, um, unfortunately got a message from Edie. Dear panelists, I hope you'll accept my sincere apologies. I was able to get audio and no video at first, and then I got video, but no audio. Um, all the pieces are amazing. I have loved getting to know them. Judith, your response to all are wonderful. I loved your response to Blue Jewel. I'm fascinated by what you had to say. Thank you, sincerely Edie. So we're so sorry that Edie wasn't able to join us. I love technology and it's great when it works. So, but she's still with us. She's listening to everything. And um, you can also reach out on the Facebook live stream, uh, watch it after the fact. And if you wanna type anything to Edie, go ahead and do that. And I hope Edie heard the comment from Jean that when I heard Blue Jewel for the first time, I thought of Judith Schechter and her blue glass and it's extra special to hear that music again. Now think of the big blue marble of the earth, microcosm and macrocosm, one of my favorite combinations. So wonderful to have that response. And then we've also heard from Larry who is also didn't get to catch up with the videos, but is inspired to go and watch all of these responses. So I hope that as people have time, I'm glad that continues to exist online to interact with. So I do think, although I would love to talk with everyone forever, I wanna perhaps, especially as there are a bit of sunshine and other things to get people to experience the day, are there any things that at least everyone should be able to go around once and add, whether it's on the question we talked about, how you are creating now, how you're feeling about things or about this project, that I just wanna give everyone a chance to say a thing or two before we go. Well, I will pipe in and say, uh, at first, even though I have a home studio that I thought was well stocked, I just found out I have no more red glass, but um, uh, I, I found it very, very hard to work. I'm a solitary person by nature with a home studio. And at first, all I could do was watch the news. Uh, uh, this is when the pandemic began. I seem to be back at that mode right now. Um, but I think, People are adaptable. I got a little more calm. I learned how to teach on Zoom, sort of. And uh, it became livable with, which is a, a double-edged sword. I don't really know that we should be adapting like this, but at least it became bearable. A lot of my students had a lot of very, very hard time. Some of them really flourished. Some of them didn't seem to know there was anything happening. It was uh, all over the map. Thanks. And I just want to say thank you so much to everybody. I really, really appreciated this opportunity and I was uh, blown away by your work. So thank you. And thanks, Jess. Always. <laughs> um, yeah, I, sort of similarly, I, I've had been up and down and struggled a lot at first. Um, the, and the big change in my own life is that now I have a four and a half year old who's home all day instead of instead of a preschool. So that's, um, you know, that takes Finding my creativity is sort of getting channeled in some new and different directions, which is interesting. I'm um, learning a lot more about video production, doing some of these quarantine videos that a lot of musicians are doing. Um, and I've been exploring doing um, sort of more electronic music kind of stuff where I make all the sounds. Um, on the computer myself, which I've never really done much before. So I'm hopeful that it can open up some new avenues of exploration ultimately, but um, I definitely miss the, miss the old days when we could all do stuff together. <laughs> yeah, so I live in Manhattan, the epicenter of the uh, virus. So it was scary at first when I was in line at the Whole Foods and then everyone looked like they're about to die in like late March. But um, I think I'm a pretty solitary person and I got used to it pretty fast. I think the first thing I noticed was that I didn't realize how much I was doing, like teaching all these people and then try to do my own thing. But I was just sort of in the routine. But I just realized like so many things I've been doing. And I just want to say thank you to Judith, to everyone. And I know I'm very privileged to do all this cool project and to shelter in place. And then I just found out in February, the Claude Oliver Gallery. Did I pronounce it right? I think the gallery is three blocks from my apartment. And it has like so many, like I think it has Judith's collections. I was finally going to go and see it. So now I have to when they open it up. 
and then all the other composers' works are beautiful. It was such a fascinating project. So thank you and stay safe. Yeah, it's been great to get to see everyone's face and hear everyone's voice. It's really been a nice, a nice thing, nice way to spend today. Um, this time's been really hard. Uh, I I feel like one way I can use my extraordinary privilege is to actually give voice to the difficulty of this time. And I'm I basically like, you know, demographically and lots of other ways hold a lot of cards and have a lot of power and resources. And it's really been a, a difficult time. And I think part of that is the incongruity between what one sees out there and what happens in a privileged four walled home where you're just like, oh, we'll plant stuff in the garden and I'll, you know, work on training my dog, you know, like he's all this stuff that just, there's so much mismatch. And, and I think that that's been really, really hard. And I know that I have it really, really easy. And I feel like it's important to say that um, to the extent that it is possible. But I, but I don't want to end that way. I want to end with just gratitude to everybody. Um, Judith, it was wonderful to get to know your work. I didn't realize that it was in Rochester. So I started trying to track this thing down and writing to like the penitentiary in Philadelphia and all this stuff <laughs> way back when this started. Um, it was just a wonderful, weird ride. And it, it's just, I'm just so grateful for it. Thank you all. Should I call on our musicians or can I hear from, does anyone from 5 by 5 want to speak and perhaps we'll wrap up with Jessica? I think I've been much like everyone else, you know, you kind of have these waves where you, you feel inspired to do something when you connect and see other people working. Um, and I think the thing that keeps me going is, is seeing the musicians, the artists that um, still dedicate themselves to their work um, even though there's other things going on and I, I find a lot of pick me up and inspiration from that. Um, I had a, a beautiful time watching a cellist play yesterday and I knew that he must to, to play with such beauty he must have been giving himself over to that music for so long um, to achieve that and to reach people so deeply and and this project has definitely given me that sense over the entire past year. And I just want to thank everyone for your dedication to your work and for continuing with it and really pouring yourselves into it. Um, it definitely serves a larger purpose in life in this world. And I'm glad that we get to all enjoy it. Thank you. Can I um, poke Marcy or Laura to say some words? Or are you sort of, if Eric has spoken for the musicians? <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah, Terry can, because he's sitting right next to her. <laughs> um, I, just, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody here for you know, coming today and for um, dealing with all of my emails and um, for just continuing the conversation. And it's been wonderful working with all of you. Um, Judith, it was a riot working with you, putting the videos together. And um, it's just, I've learned so much from this and um, you all inspire me. And um, thank you for your art. I second that. Thank you, everybody, for everything that you've contributed to this, for the amazing experiences that I've gotten to have with, with um, the musicians that I play with and the composers that we've heard from and worked with, and, and for Judith's inspiring art and your um, amazing personality. I wish you were not my next door neighbor. We would be hanging out all the time. <laughs> You'd never see me. <laughs> Well, if I could, I would like to also express my gratitude um, to Laura. Thank you for your persistence. Really, your, your will to make this happen has, has been inspiring to me. And what a wonderful thing you've helped to create here. Um, I also wanted to thank just a couple of my colleagues who were really instrumental, Deborah McDowell Hernandez, who really kind of kicked it off here at MAG, and Jessica Gaspari were key in, um, with the programming. And everybody who is who is on the Zoom call right now, I, I just am in awe. And I'm really super grateful to have 
this additional sort of angle and way of experiencing something beautiful in the world. Um, and this piece, The Battle of Carnival in Lent um, by Judith Schechter is, is in our collection at MAG. So to have these um, responses, these musical original pieces in response to it are now forever connected um, to a piece in our collection. And isn't that, isn't that a wonderful thing for us to have? So thank you all. And of course, thank you all for being here, both all our panelists and also everyone who's been watching on Facebook and Zoom. Roll credits, Terry, I guess. So today's experience happened thanks to the collaboration of many people from different places, including, of course, artist Judith Schechter and our four composers, as well as New Music USA. We want to thank them for the project grant funding that's made Glassworks Commissioning Project possible, and the Memorial Art Gallery and curator Jessica Martin and all those who she mentioned behind the scenes for this wonderful exhibit. The Genesee Valley Arts Grants through the New York State Council on the Arts Decentralization Program, whose funding also helped with programming connected to this project. Bravo to all the musicians of 5 by 5 and artistic Laura Lentz for playing this music and bringing together the whole project, inspiring us through the creative spirit, of modern chamber music. Thanks so much to our uh, technical director today, Terry Bacon, for making all this happen. And to the Eastman Artist Share Partnership, that's the platform where you can stay connected to more of the project, pre-order the album that will be recorded when it's safe to arrange all of that. You'll find a link to that from 5x5music.com or by searching for glassworks at artistshare.com. So thanks all for being here to share this experience, this sort of virtual artist salon and stay safe and let's stay in touch. This is, a, I think, a journey of experience and meaning that continues.